Hello and welcome to Nevermind the Bar Charts with myself, Mark Pack. I'm delighted to be joined this time by Manira Wilson, elected MP for Twickenham in December, and now the party's health and social care spokesman. Hello, Manira, and thanks very much for joining the show. Hi, Mark. Thanks for inviting me on. Um, one thing I've noticed that comes up consistently when really successful MPs of all parties give advice to newer MPs, it's that it's best to take the time to find your feet as an MP rather than trying to make a big splash from day one. But of course, you were elected as an MP in December, <laughs> straight into the Brexit votes and now the coronavirus crisis. So that good advice probably hasn't been possible to follow. <laughs> how, have, how have you found it being an MP in such difficult circumstances? Uh, well, if I'm being very candid, absolutely overwhelming. And yes, as you say, you haven't. there's not really been a chance to sort of slow down, take a deep breath and, and really sort of take stock of, of what's going on and how you want to approach things and, and find your feet, as it were. I mean, it was straight from a full on uh, breakneck speed campaign straight into Parliament. We had quite a busy first parliamentary week after we got elected and then yes we had recess over Christmas uh, I managed to get a few days off then but I was already doing quite a lot in the constituency and then as you say Brexit legislation in January and then um, as a health and social care spokesperson I already had two bits of health legislation that I was uh, leading the party on uh, in February and early March and then uh, and then the coronavirus uh, crisis obviously started to pick up over that time and I should say in those first few months I was also the party's transport spokesperson so we had the HS2 decision we had the the Heathrow court judgment which is mm. also very very relevant to my own constituency so I was pretty busy with that as well as all the issues to do with train franchising and my constituency again is, is massively impacted by southwestern railway so I was I was thrown right into it uh, with both health issues and transport issues and being a new constituency MP and and then of course the coronavirus crisis hit and I mean for every MP that has been just like a complete tsunami so it's been a, a I think a very unusual experience as a brand new MP but for me and, and the other MPs. And I guess one respect in which you've maybe been a little bit lucky is that this big health and social care brief that you've got does cover some of the same territory as where you worked in professionally before you became an MP because you've worked in the pharmaceutical sector. I guess that's probably partly why you've ended up being the health and social care spokesman as well. But have you found that, that background in working in the pharmaceutical sector helpful in terms of understanding how things look from the other side of the fence when you're in Parliament or the government is trying to legislate or get the pharmaceutical sector to do particular things? Yeah, I'd say where it's been most helpful is because a health and social care, I mean, social care is, I'd say, a much newer area for me, but the health side of things is it's so complex. It's such a technical area in terms of the structures of the NHS and how it's organised, the processes, how the money flows. Um, so actually having that sort of, macro overview and some insight and understanding into how the health service works and how decisions are made that affect patients day to day how the money flows um, from working in health policy um, in the commercial sector and briefly in the charity sector before that has been massively helpful uh, the pharmaceutical side of things has helped to some extent for example um, one of the pieces of legislation I worked on a couple of months ago was around the regulation of uh, medicines and medical devices now that we've left the European Union so having that background obviously was helpful very helpful um, I think I was probably uh, one of only two MPs with an industry background who participated in, in the debates around that bill, for instance. And certainly in the current crisis, when people are talking about trials around treatments, as well as vaccines, uh, I obviously am able to bring some level of understanding, but most importantly, a network of contacts that I can call on to try and understand things better. So, um, you know, I come from an industry that works on, in vaccines. I personally never worked in vaccines, but I know plenty of people who did, and I can pick up the phone and say, well, can you help me to understand uh, this particular thing that they're talking about today, or how we're going to start to to scale up manufacturing once we find a, a, a successful candidate you know what's going to be the prioritization process and a lot of those questions don't have answers but at least I can phone up the right people to understand some of the thinking that's going on behind that. that that's really interesting that point about having the right network of people to be able to call on for advice because 
at one level that sounds really obvious that clearly that's a good thing to have and MPs who have that will be better MPs but I'll plead guilty to whenever I've been in say PPC selection the parliamentary candidate selection and thinking about the relative merits of different candidates before voting myself as to which one I think should get it I don't think I've ever really properly thought through well you know, not only which is the one who maybe is the best campaigner, which is the one who seems to be the best speaker, but which is the one who is, has that network of knowledge available to them. Because that's quite a powerful advantage to have as an MP, isn't it? I think it is, but I, 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 don't, I think it's generally a good thing that you wouldn't necessarily hmm. uh, pick or vote for someone based on their network, because obviously you know, hmm. sometimes that can be an unfair advantage hmm. depending. On your on your background or, or your education and there yeah. might be people who aren't necessarily very well connected in a particular area who might be fantastic candidates or yeah MPs. it's it's the sort of criteria that i guess will end up people voting for lots of middle class white men who have been to oxford or cambridge perhaps right <laughs> Um, and you know, I, I'm not white or, or male, but I, I guess I've classed myself as middle class and, and went to Oxbridge as well. So I probably have a slightly unfair advantage. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's not something I tr I try and trade on. I'm, it's something I, I've always naturally done whenever I've come across a problem or a question. I think, oh well, who who do I know who might know the answer or might know somebody else? And it's something. As I say, it's something I've very naturally done. I think that's why I ended up uh, being successful in, in my career doing public affairs, because a lot of that is networking and making those right connections to be able to find the right answers or, or influence how people are thinking. Uh, and I think it's, it's a really important skill as an MP, even if you don't come with that ready-made network. It's, it's having that confidence to be able to go to people and say, look, I don't know the answer. Help me to work out what the, what the best way forward is. You've obviously particularly having to deploy that knowledge at the moment to coronavirus. How, what's your take on how the government is doing? Because at the time that we're talking about it, it looks like that the peak in deaths has mm. probably passed and that we're in the sort of slow decline phase at the moment. And I'm slightly hesitant about sounding too positive about that because that still means every day several hundred people are dying. I mean, yeah, more people are dying each day than would be a massive scandal on its own in normal Absolutely. times. But it does seem that we're probably past the worst of at least the first wave of coronavirus. So have you, are you, are you forming any views yet on how you think the government has been doing? Uh, yes, I, I have some views on that. I mean, obviously, it's it's an unprecedented crisis. And whatever government, whatever their political colour, I think would have uh, struggled, uh, given that we've not had this sort of health uh, issue to deal with for, for about a century. And as a responsible opposition, we've taken the view to try and be as constructive as possible and work uh, cross-party in the national interest. That said, I think it's right and proper as a responsible opposition that we we ask tough questions and I think we've seen over the last couple of weeks especially particularly since Easter I'd say uh, things starting to unravel in terms of it becoming crystal clear that there were a, a whole set of actions that should have been taken by the government much much sooner whether that's on testing infrastructure, whether that's on PPE, protective equipment, supplies. They've done so well, for example, um, in building up hospital capacity mm. with the Nightingale hospitals and freeing up capacities in other existing hospitals, uh, which is phenomenal. And I think sometimes they're coming in for criticism that they, you know, they've created a white elephant with these, with these Nightingales. Well, frankly, if we were seeing uh, people on, on trolleys and corridors right now with coronavirus, we'd all be piling into the government mm. criticising them. So I think credit where credit's due, I'd rather we had all that excess capacity. What I don't understand is why that same focus and drive and determination and resource for building hospital capacity wasn't also putting in, put into testing, tracing and isolating, which the WHO has said from the beginning is the way forward, which we've seen other countries like Taiwan do so, so successfully. And in fact, Ed, Davey and I were in a, a private meeting with officials uh, in early March, just around the time they changed their policy from tracing, uh, contact tracing everybody who tested positive 
to, to, to narrowing their criteria. And I pushed very, very hard in that meeting. Like, Why are you stopping uh, testing? Surely we should be testing more. And I'm still bemused why they stopped doing that uh, then and changed policy and why we didn't have you know, that investment in infrastructure coming again from the life sciences sector. Yeah. I remember thinking when they, uh, soon after they put out the call for manufacturers to turn over their production lines to ventilators, well, you could do that with the lab capacity across the life sciences sector. Yeah. And they have done that, but several weeks later, and we've seen all, all the, all the um, issues with delays and lack of um, stock of protective equipment uh, where, and the failure to participate in European procurement schemes both for protective equipment and ventilators. Um, so I think there are a lot of questions to be answered and we saw the Sunday Times expose about a week ago um, showing some of the, the lack of focus, the lack of seriousness. You know, I'd like to think that that, that a Liberal Democrat government might have taken um, some of that scientific advice in terms of the, the serious nature of what was coming our way, you know, much, much more seriously and taken, taken action sooner. But I mean, it's, I think it's easy to stand from the outside and, and commentate, but it's, it's very clear other countries uh, have, I think, responded much more decisively and quickly. I wonder if part of it is that I mean, in life in general, but also particularly in politics, it's a lot easier to get your act together to deliver something that's a one-off. So a one-off project is easier to make happen if you're a politician than to improve the quality and the flow of something consistently over time. So it's easier to build a school than to improve the quality of teaching in the classrooms than yeah, in the school. And therefore, yeah. perhaps it's easier to build a series of one-offs like uh, NHS Nightingale, really impressive that scale of capacity really quickly, but that was just a one-off project. Improving the flow of PPE from production through to distribution is a much harder problem and perhaps as you say what it is in part is the government has got some really important things right but they've been the slightly easier things to get right and the harder things that really show up how well or not you're prepared you were are the ones that sadly, tragically, have not been handled nearly as well? Yes, I mean, I think, I think there's a couple of things. I think um, one is the hospital is, is a tangible thing. It's uh, you know, that they can point to, I'm sorry to say this, but it's, 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 a, it's a slightly sexier project in that sense than you know, uh, rubber gloves and masks, etc. And it's, as you say, it's, it's, it's bricks mortar and you can just you can get the kit in there. And, and, and I think it's easy to run it as a centralized project. The, the, the other issue that I, I think has come to the fore in this crisis is this desire to run everything from the center. I think building a set of field hospitals and managing that process and that project from the center I think works well as we've seen. However, the distribution of PPE or the uh, mm. rolling out of test sites right across the country is something that needs to be much more locally driven and not necessarily by the centre. Mm. And you know, we as Liberal Democrats, who have obviously a strong and rich history in local government, um, and and see the benefits of that sort of from the bottom up approach. Uh, completely appreciate that and are frustrated by that and you know I, I saw a, an email from a director of social services in my own borough earlier this week about well there's a central strategy now for testing but we're probably going to to try and drive things our own way locally because there's just such a lack of confidence in what's coming from the center we know that one of the reasons there was a, a delay in scaling up of testing was because public health england wanted to run everything out the center and didn't want to have you know, lots of small labs around the country participating. But in a, in a crisis like this, you've got to harness every asset you've got in every part of the country. And that may in, seem inefficient, but actually when you need all hands to the deck, um, I think being able to, to, to harness those assets using your local authority structures to be able to do that is, is really, really important. Mm. So I guess thinking about the international picture and how different countries seem to be managing to do things mm. less well or, or better than others. I mean, some of the most successful have been quite small countries, quite small mm. places. And sometimes that does seem to have been very driven by the centre. 
But it may well be that for countries that are of the scale of the UK, Germany, France, etc., that it, it has to be much more based in localities. And maybe that is in part why a country like Germany with a very strong culture of devolution in terms of governance and public service and so on, maybe that's why countries like Germany have in some respects handled this better. Germany, for example, I think has recruited um, an army of, of tracers to do contact tracers. Um, mm. And that's largely on a localised level. Mm. Um, because they understand that, that that sort of work needs to be done in the community at that local level. Um, so I, I think I think that's probably one of the reasons why it's um, why it's done so well. On the other hand, and possibly to slightly contradict myself, you look at uh, Italy, which obviously massively struggled in terms of their health system being overwhelmed. And that was, I mean, talking to some British officials, they felt that one of the problems that Italy had was because actually their healthcare system is so regionalised um, and therefore having a centralised coordinated approach in terms of the healthcare side of things, which as I say we've seen has happened very well here in terms of making sure we've got adequate capacity to treat people, um, didn't work so well. So it's, it's interesting to see that. That's why I say I think in terms of the healthcare approach, in terms of hospital capacity, I think the centralised approach has worked well. Community testing and tracing, uh, less so, and essentially also the supply of PPE because I think local authorities again know where the needs are and, and uh, outside of the NHS setting making sure that everything goes through local authorities rather than care homes and other care providers having to order their own equipment which is at massively inflated prices and then not be able to access it because other NHS organisations are buying it all up would, would have helped in terms of that coordination. Yeah the Germany question of how they have handled coronavirus compared to Britain and will it look like as it currently seems will be the case that it, that overall Germany ends up being seen as having handled it better than Britain is I think particularly intriguing for a couple of reasons one is the one we've touched on about how much more devolved the operation of public services and the state is in Germany the other is that Germany has a culture because of its tragic history in the first half of the last century of being super sensitive about privacy and personal data. And the example I often use when talking with other Lib Dem activists that really brings it to light is in Germany for the, a long time, and I think it's still the case, but certainly for a long time it was the case, that political parties had to destroy their canvas data after an election, because oh, that well. the very well, idea of keeping records of what party people support was just anathema given how such information was horrifically misused in the first half of the last century. Um, and so the, if, if it turns out Germany has managed to find a way of doing, for example, contact tracing really successfully, despite that very strong privacy culture, I can imagine we're all going to be lining up to want to learn lessons from that, because it does seem like quite a dilemma we're going to face yeah. about the virtue of being able to very quickly identify everyone that someone has been in contact with over a period of weeks if you discover that that person has got coronavirus and there's that certainly leaves me quite uneasy do I really yeah. want Pretty Patel in the home office to be able to find out all that information <laughs> about me? I don't want Pretty Patel to know anything about me um but no I mean as a as as a liberal I feel deeply uncomfortable mm. with it but then as I've said before, we're in an unprecedented situation and therefore we are allowing ourselves to be subjected to unprecedented measures. You know, I'm, we all feel deeply uncomfortable with the restrictions on our movements at the moment. Um, but the only way we're going to be able to ease that in a safe way um, is, is by allowing other restrictions to come in on that, whether that's uh, to do with our data and contact tracing and, and how we interact with people as measures as the lockdown measures start to be lifted and that's one of the things that i and the liberal democrats have been calling for for several weeks now it's interesting that everyone's talking about you know the conservative backbenchers and, and labor politicians in the last few days are saying this I and mean, we were saying this two to three weeks ago that actually we need to have an open discussion with the public about what lifting the lockdown might look like um, because there needs to be that transparency, that ac accountability and that scrutiny around any uh, measures that are brought in because if we are going to um, test uh, 
trace and isolate that is going to require a huge amount of surveillance and giving over of personal data which we all feel deeply uncomfortable with there need to be rigorous safeguards in place um, and a cast iron guarantee that that data will be destroyed uh, as soon as it is absolutely no longer needed um, and that there is complete accountability over how government is using that data there's part proper parliamentary scrutiny um, and that there is that that members of the public can opt in rather than be forced to do this so all of those things need to happen that needs to be part of a, a public discussion but you know the government's treating us like children turning around saying well we can't talk about anything outside of the current lockdown because that's going to create mixed messages well you know i think I think the, the, the public can cope with, with that. And actually, we've seen that people have been very compliant with the lockdown and actually are quite afraid to start going back to school or work or wherever it may be, even if the, that lockdown starts to be lifted in some way, shape or form. So I think we need to give a bit more credit to, to the public about being able to deal with you know, a couple of different sets of messages and, and participate in this discussion around what life might look like post lockdown. Mm, um, last time I talked with Ben Johnson, the former Lib Dem councillor in Southwark, but now he works at Nature. Um, and so we were just talking about coronavirus and he made the really good point that the flip side of some of the stories in the media about whether young people in particular are following lockdown rules as well as we might all wish, was that he has seen that younger people are particularly volunteering in very heavy numbers for local food banks and the like and that there's a slight double-edged nature to if people feel that maybe coronavirus will be a little bit less serious for them that might lead to them in some senses behaving in ways that we wish they shouldn't of being a little bit more risk-taking but the flip side is that also seems to mean that a lot of people are therefore more willing to volunteer because they think well actually if I'm a bit healthier, if I'm not at higher risk, then this is okay. I can go and do stuff to help other people safely. And I think that mix of, you know, the good and the bad is something that doesn't come out very clearly from the media coverage. Because, of course, even though you can sort of see media outlets struggling to be responsible, at heart, it is so deep in their culture that the shocking bad news, the things yeah. that get our emotions really worked up, that make us click through on the link in the story, that make us share it, that's so much part of the way the media operates that, that, yeah. that, that we keep on relapsing, as it were, into stories about the exceptional awful. Uh, also, leavened by stories of the exceptional wonderful behaviour by people, but it can be quite hard to really get a picture of what the overall pattern is. But I think the data that we've seen on lockdown suggests that it's working pretty well, doesn't it? There's quite high compliance. I don't know if in your role in Parliament you've seen, you've seen any other data to sort of add nuance to that, but it seems like, generally speaking, for all that we love to you know, not trust politicians and all of that, as a nation, we've basically said, oh, we've been told to do something, yet yeah, we better go and do it then. Yeah. No, um, I, I've only seen the, the public data that everybody else sees every day at the news conferences. Um, and yes, it's, it, it's remarkable. And I think it's great that people are following that advice. But I think even, even more so that actually, whilst people have that trust and confidence, that, that the government maybe start to let them in a bit on what things might look like in a few, a few weeks' time and a few months' time. Because... Uh, whilst people are being compliant and patient at the moment, I think that will wear thin. And I, and I think it's, if I may say so, Mark, it's easy for you and I to sit here and say, mm. yes, it's all fine, because, you know, we, we have nice homes to live in. I've got a garden. I live in a beautiful part mm. of the world in southwest London where I've got several parks on my doorstep. I've just been out for a, a run in, in the sun in those parks um, this morning. Um, and, and we all know there are plenty of people who just don't have access to green space, who uh, you've got overcrowded families in, in tiny one or two bed flats. Um, there's a huge amount of domestic abuse that really, really worries me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I find the figures for that devastating. Um, and actually, if you're living in that sort of situation, you'll be just desperate to know when you can get out of that. And we probably don't hear those stories quite as much. Yeah. I'm, I mean, one thing I've realised I'm very lucky in terms of where I live is that I live near quite a lot of quiet residential streets that are on hills 
And I had never thought of that as being a plus point. But what that means is if I go out sort of very early in the morning or reasonably late in the evening for a walk, I can walk up and down very quiet streets. And because it involves going up and down hills, I can get a reasonable amount of exercise in actually pretty quickly. And, and I guess that illustrates a much wider issue of social inequality that yeah. we've always known that things like being able to afford to live in a nicer place brings all sorts of benefits. But coronavirus has really brought out just mm. how stark the differences can be. Uh, I think it was Emily Maitlis who had her famous opening on Newsnight uh, a week or so ago about, you know, people talk about this being a great level of, well, it isn't, and mm. it went viral. Um, yeah. And I completely agree with her. And if anything, it's really shone a light on uh, the deep inequalities uh, in our society in terms of, sort of housing and the sort of spaces that we live in, but also... Um, I think when you look at the statistics that show the BAME community has been um, significantly more impacted uh, by COVID-19 in terms of the deaths we've seen to date and in terms of particularly in terms of the healthcare workers who have sadly lost their lives. I think that you can see there's a, to some extent, there's a correlation between the sorts of uh, jobs uh, that are being done, a lot of the key worker roles, uh, which are, are quite low paid, um, that are often uh, disproportionately done uh, by those in the BAME community. Um, and, and these are the people who are now turning around and saying, well, actually, in our new immigration system, we don't want them coming into the country. Well, they're keeping our country going at the moment. So I think it's, it's thrown up all sorts of uh, questions about how we address inequality, how we um, you know, pay the most important people in our society who keep us going in terms of feeding us and keeping us well and keeping us moving. Um, and you know, although we've talked about the BAME community, I mean, what I'd like to see is actually some, some data on um, what might be considered the white working class communities who also would probably fit into some of those demographics. And you know, a lot of those people have got underlying health conditions who we also know are more disproportionately affected. So I think there's, it, I, I'm, I'm hoping uh, you know, that the sort of silver lining, if you can even call it that, that comes out of this crisis and the tragedy of the you know thousands of, of lost lives is that we start to think about uh, both inequality and indeed the environment which we've seen a massive positive impact on in recent weeks as a result of the lockdown um, that we start to actually tackle those issues with a far greater urgency than we ever did because they've just been so sharply brought to the fore now uh, in a way that I think, you know, Liberal Democrats have been talking about for a long time. And yes, there's been some movement um, at, at, at all levels of government. But now I think it's really laid bare before our eyes. And I'm hoping it might actually spark uh, all governments of all colours into to far greater action. Mm. And that neatly leads to maybe the last question, which is a lot of these issues are longer term political issues that will be... Yeah important in all sorts of different ways, even if a vaccine for coronavirus is discovered tomorrow, mm -hmm. some, tackling these sorts of issues of social inequality. And in a normal time, this part of the political cycle is when people are often beginning to think about, do they want to make a serious tilt at running for parliament at the next general election? And do they want to put much of the rest of their life on hold for several years to have a real go at being a target seat candidate and the like as somebody who's recently been a successful target seat candidate have you got any advice or tips for people who are thinking about is that a choice they want to make um well so the, the, the normal advice would be well if you're if, you, if you're up for doing this sort of thing get out there and start campaigning and clearly i can't tell you to go <laughs> and do that because that, that's not allowed uh, just to reinforce that's not allowed while we're in lockdown um, but there will, obviously the, there's lots of other ways you could be involved in your community if you aren't already um, in terms of volunteering if it's if it's safe for you to do so um, but uh, I guess the, the good thing about uh, the current situation is you've got time and space to think about it um, and look at the forms and you know, get there's uh, get in touch with people in the party and uh, there's various uh, groups of people particularly for example, if you're a woman, there's a campaign for gender balance. If you're an ethnic minority, there's a Lib Dem campaign for racial equality. There's also the, the Candidates Association. Um, and so there's all sorts of groups within the party who can put you in touch with people um, to, to, 
chat to over Zoom or over the phone while we're in lockdown about uh, what's involved, what the process is. Um, but uh, I mean, I think you were talking about putting your life on hold. I mean, that that's the big trade off you've got to make and the big the big decisions you've got to make in your life and depending on wh what your personal situation is as to whether you can really make that sort of sacrifice because if you want to go for a, a, a really winnable seat mm. it, first of all you've got to get yourself to a place where you might have a fighting chance of actually being selected which requires quite a lot of time investment in terms of raising your profile with the membership and, and actually having a, a record of campaigning action and, and success that you can draw on and showcase as part of the selection as to why you would make a good parliamentary candidate and then of course you've got to build the team to run and deliver a campaign to win a, a marginal seat and um, that takes a lot of time and commitment uh, and money even if you're not putting your own money into the campaign you may need to take a hit on your own uh, personal income to do that um, these are some of the challenges we face as a candidate and actually one of the reasons why I almost didn't end up becoming an MP myself you know I, I was very fortunate with the circumstances in terms of how they they, they panned out in that there was a a very short selection which then led into a very short run-up to a general election but it, if that hadn't been the case and we were looking at a 2022 general election it's quite likely that I wouldn't have been able to put myself forward because I have two young children and I had mm. a very busy full-time job as the main breadwinner in my my household and so you know, I think politics is is always uh, a, a large dose of luck and mm. circumstances mixed in with that hard work and, and planning. And you know, I, I mean, I did put in a lot of work into in, as a councillor and as a GLA candidate in this area over many years. So I was already well established, which meant that when the unexpected opportunity arose, I was in a good position mm. to go for it. And, but that was sort of years and years of investment of time, energy and dedication. And obviously, I mean, I enjoyed it. I wouldn't have done it otherwise. And it's massively rewarding when you are helping your, your local community. That's why I'm here. I wanted to serve my local community as well as my country. And boy, I had no idea this is what I would be, uh, you know, I'd be faced with this particular circumstance. Yeah. But uh, despite the, the stress of it and and how draining it can be on your energy and your personal time I, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else and i'm very glad that you were there as well uh yeah. thank you very much for that that's absolutely fascinating i'll include in the show notes for listeners links to the campaign for gender balance and the other organizations that manira mentioned as well as to the podcast episode i did with ben johnson uh, that i referred to and i'll also include a link to the lib dem campaign to improve the conditions for frontline care workers which i think is very relevant to a lot of the issues that you talked about manira so thank you very much for your time today manira people can find manira on twitter at manira wilson that's m-u-n-i-r-a wilson myself at mark pack and this uh, podcast at bar chart podcast and if you like listening please do tell others about the podcast and rate or review it in your favorite podcast app Thank you very much.